Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Duana Butler. I'm the program coordinator here at New York Women in Film and Television. We're really excited about the panel this evening. Um, just so you know, um, in case anyone's not clear about what NYWIF does, we have four different areas that we focus on. We focus on workshops and career development. We preserve women's films. We advocate for equity in the business. And we celebrate women's achievements. Um, NYWIF is a membership organization of 2,000 members, and we are part of 40 chapters worldwide. Um, we're really excited because our members produce our programs, and the program that you've come to tonight is produced by Kelly Devine and Pearl Park. Um, I did want to say that we are taping the program this evening, so at a certain point it will be uploaded to our website, so you know, stay tuned on that. And also we have another exciting program coming up on April 27th, called Streaming Stories, Short Docs for the Web. So do check our website for more details about that. That is actually filling up as well. And I think that between these two different programs, they have a really nice relationship to one another. So we hope to see you then. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Kelly Devine, who will be our moderator this evening. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, before I start introducing this very esteemed panel that I've got together, just wanted to give you kind of a sense of, uh, of what we wanted to accomplish and, and uh, what we all discussed amongst ourselves to kind of set the stage. Um, we all know that documentary filmmakers, uh, filmmakers of any type, are facing a very challenging environment. Um, I remember reading um, in Movie Maker magazine a couple of years ago that as of 2012, there were over 50,000 feature-length films, docs and narratives, that had gone to festivals and markets around the world. So uh, I can't imagine that it's, that number has decreased uh, in the intervening years. So there are all the other films that you have to compete with. There uh, is social media that you have to compete with. There are games that you have to compete with. And unfortunately, we all have to compete with cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> so we do have a challenging landscape, but we hope to give you a sense of of thinking about, you know, um, actually saying that, that it's never too early to start thinking about distribution in a constructive way because it might inform what kind of end product you actually end up with. Uh, just as Duana had mentioned, uh, the, the program that's going to be in April later this month, talking about formatting short docs uh, for the web. There is a particular uh, style to that. There is a particular consumer for that. And so you need to keep those kinds of things in mind when you're thinking about what you're, you know, why you are picking up the camera, which is, um, I think, a question we, you know, we need to ask ourselves as filmmakers because it's a, big, it's a big word, filmmaker, but it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean that you are someone involved with the form and the craft and that your ultimate audience is, uh, is cinephiles, um, your ultimate audience are people who go to art house theaters. You could be an activist who has uh, a dedication to a particular cause. And so, you know, how you determine your expectations and how you measure your success will not be through commercial terms, and the risks and the challenges that you're willing to accept will be very different. Are you a journalist who is, or an educator who is using a camera and those storytelling tools uh, as a part of your toolkit to communicate the information. Again, your end product will be very different, your career path will be very different, and the, the kind of network that you create. So I just wanted to kind of think about how we do throw around these very big terms, documentary filmmaker, but it means a lot of things to the people who pick up cameras, and it means a lot of different things to the audience as well. So those are some of the things that we're going to try and unpack when we think about how, uh, you know, how to construct or how to consider your audience. I know it's a cliche. People say, know your audience, but usually they don't unpack it any further from that. And that's some of the things that we want to try and do is connect what that phrase means, know your audience, to some of the actual options that you have to decide between. And with that, I want to start with uh, Robert Siegel, on my right, esteemed entertainment attorney. Hi, Deb. Uh, I've been an entertainment attorney for over 20 years, and basically it, it's intriguing because I've seen uh, the documentary, I handle fiction, but I, uh, more and more of my work was in the nonfiction area because 
the you know, kind of the gateway, the entrance is a little less daunting than say uh, fiction, and then you could do it uh, incrementally over time, which often you measure in years uh, in order to get your documentary done. And uh, I remember, you know, again, I remember certain things like. Uh, you know, basically, where's your documentary go? I mean, what choice did you really have? I mean, you had public television, and that was it for television, <laughs> yeah, because very rarely the networks would generally acquire a documentary, let alone, you know, any, anything that was nonfiction. And, and then basically, technology came in, and now basically, you have more different uh, venues. That's the good news, bad news is, they, it's hard to monetize a lot of those. So uh, a lot of times I'm dealing with clients and I tell them sometimes your financing is gonna tell you about your distribution because basically I'll have clients go to PBS or WNET or the Latino or you know, or, or basically or Native American or, or some other coalition or affiliate of public television and when that happens, there's your TV rights basically, and there's going to be some streaming, you know, uh, immediately at, during the, you know, during the documentary that you better be mindful of, and how do you balance the different windows or gate entrance points into markets, and that's kind of what I deal with for, in a good part. And then Caitlin Boyle represents what I think is, is uh, uh, a kind of new pathway of distribution uh, it came up informally, community screenings, but now it really is being formalized. And so, Caitlin, please uh, introduce yourself and let them know about Film Sprout. Sure. Hi. Um, my name is Caitlin Boyle. I am the um, founder of uh, Film Sprout. Um, we are we call ourselves a grassroots distribution company. So we specialize in creating community and campus screening campaigns, um, distribution campaigns for documentary features, um, and. Yeah, I think um, I started Film Sprout formally in 2009, and I did this kind of work for a couple of years before starting Film Sprout. And um, what I really was responding to in starting Film Sprout is this um, demand from audiences to have access to documentary. Um, and in even even seven seven or eight years ago, um, the sort of accessibility of documentaries was there was not a lot of infrastructure for that. Um, I came from a production background and used to work at WNET. And one of the things that was most frustrating is you would work so hard on a project and it would air, and then people would write in saying, you know, I want to show this in my church, or I want to bring this to my classroom, or um, at my conference. And we were kind of like, uh, okay, uh, how do we respond? You know, there wasn't, there wasn't really a protocol for responding to that demand. Um, and there certainly wasn't a, a protocol for being proactive about soliciting that kind of demand. So Film Sprout was intended to be an answer to that gap um, to say, you know, how can we create and facilitate a way for audiences to get content where they live and still have a cinematic experience. So, you know, still see the film in a public place, um, maybe pay an admission fee, talk about it afterward, um, see it with some, at least some standard of, you know, quality around the exhibition. Um, and also provide for filmmakers a ready and willing and motivated audience um, for their films. So, you know, kind of meeting, meeting the demand on both sides of the equation. And uh, Emily Russo, uh, the co-founder of Zeitgeist, um, we apologize we didn't have her bio up because uh, your partner Nancy was supposed to be here, but she is, uh, uh, we're so thankful that you're coming in. So please, uh, you know, uh, tell, tell everybody a bit about uh, Zeitgeist, which is a wonderful uh, uh, distributor of art film. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, Zeitgeist Films has been in business for 26 years. Nancy and I started the company together in late 1988. And uh, one of our first hits or films that we did was a documentary called Let's Get Lost that was uh, directed by Bruce Weber and was nominated for an Academy Award. So we, we sort of hit the ground running um, in, that, in that way. 
Um, I've always been really interested in documentaries. I, I studied film and I wrote my senior thesis on the Maisel Brothers films. And uh, came down to New York from Binghamton and interviewed Albert and David. He was alive at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, just I've always been really moved by documentary films. And, and Zeitgeist has focused on both foreign language films and documentaries. We've done very little American independent film per se, a couple of uh, titles here and there. We did Todd Haynes' first film, which was Poison, which was certainly an American indie film. But we've done a lot of docs and, and a lot of foreign language films. And part of the reason I think why we do a lot of foreign language films, uh, including even foreign language documentaries, such as Integrate Silence, which was one of our, our very popular ones, is, is funding issues, because those films are funded in Europe, and the, they, they are already paid for by film bodies and by broadcasters, and so those rights are more obtainable for us. A lot of the American docs come encumbered with potential broadcast restrictions and, and other things, so it's navigating that acquisition process. We've done also a huge number of Canadian films, a huge number, and there's no, surprise there. It's the same thing. The National Film Board or Telefilm supports Canadian filmmakers and they get funding and they make terrific films. We did Manufactured Landscapes. We did other films from Jennifer Bashwal. Um, we did The Corporation. I mean, you know, the list is, is extensive and those films receive the benefit of, of their government support um, for the arts, which unfortunately the American filmmakers sitting here probably know you don't get that too much. So it makes it tricky. But um, our model has always been really to do a theatrical. We've, we try to take films on that we feel have theatrical potential, and we release them in theaters first. And then we release them into other platforms on DVD, digitally now, um, broadcast if, if that's uh, available, although that's gotten increasingly difficult over the last few years as well. Uh, but that, that theatrical model for us has just been sort of the key to making our films really successful because it's really in theaters where people come together, as you just described, to watch a film and have that experience and generate a discussion and have maybe the context of a, a, of a speaker or somebody who's you know, just organizing the film for them in some way so that they can really appreciate it and get something out of it and carry it away. And that's just, the, that plants the, that's the bloom, you know, that makes the film kind of just bloom. And then it, all the other markets really roll into place from there. And our, our successful theatrical releases on, on documentaries perform really well in other markets as well. And we do still do DVD releases and now we're getting more into the digital realm. And you were mentioning The Gleaners and I, you know, was one of the films that we did that you taught when you were teaching. So that, the Agnes Varda film, uh, you know, they're all gems. They're all gems. And Randy Chachin from uh, Films Media Group, uh, please tell us about your terrific platform that you have, what makes you, uh, I think, a rather unique uh, educational distribution company. Thanks. Um, so Films Media Group is uh, started as Films for the Humanities and Sciences in 1959 um, and is distributed on 16 millimeter film and Laserdisc and VHS and DVD and now primarily on streaming. So uh, we do some, you know, DVD distribution and individual um, streaming, but the world is moving towards streaming and streaming collections is how most people are accustomed to getting their content these days. So um, this is the, the uh, website for the for Films Media Group. This shows some of our streaming collections we have, like nursing, um, and then also individual titles. We have um, an amazing world cinema collection, actually. Um, so we're distributing to universities, public libraries, um, and the K-12 market, and the company also has um, a streaming platform called Learn360, which reaches the K-12 market, and I think has about a third of that market across America and much in Canada. So, um, you know, some distributors are very boutique and, and working very closely with individual films, and we're, you know, really large and working with uh, many, many schools. Uh, we have, you know, millions of potential viewers out there. Um, 
And I just wanted to show a little bit about our streaming platform. This is one of my favorites um, about employee ownership, we the owners. Um, we take films in every subject area, so the collections are psychology, anthropology, archival, history, world cinema, and, and really, you know, our institutional customers, um, viewers are looking for content that goes directly into a course syllabus, so they're looking for content, we're always looking for content that's, you know, very closely linked to what's being taught. Um, and so that's, you know, something for everybody to think about. Is this something that's already being taught or something that, you know, we wish was taught? Um, and just a little bit about our platform. Each title we have uh, streams, you know, directly from the site. Um, and you'll see over here each film has, um, it's broken down into like two to four minute segments, sort of like DVD chapters, but they're each written about and each one has a transcript that's also in, um, interactive that you can actually search. So uh, every student in a school that subscribes has access to the collection. Um, they also can get all the films through their school's um, library card catalog. So if they just go to the library and search for something, you know, any film that they have in the collection will go there. So I think that this is really, you know, the direction that a lot of distribution is going. Um, and it comes with amazing resources and, and we're getting you know, incredible content to schools. Um, and it's a different scale you know, than I think folks have been used to. So uh, I think that's it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. So one thing before I dive into questions with the panel, um, if any of you guys have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand, but please wait until we can get a microphone to you. Since we're filming, we want to make sure that all the questions go through the microphone. Um, but uh, so part of the reason I assembled these people is sort of to represent, um, you know, we have the, what we like to think of as the traditional theatrical model, um, that someone would purchase your film, purchase, take your film rights, and take the film into theaters, then through all of what you know have been called the ancillary windows, and but that's not really necessarily the way every film or every uh, you know or 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 every piece of media will go now. You know, so that's why I also wanted Caitlin here to uh, to demonstrate what what sort of started is uh, you know from my conversations uh, back when I was an acquisitions person at IFC, the Independent Film Channel. The community screenings back in the late 90s and early 2000s were really this nascent phenomenon, and it was really driven by communities, not really by the filmmakers searching out, and certainly not necessarily by distributors. I remember distributors telling me that they would get calls uh, that somebody in a, a, a multi-purpose room or a firehouse or whatever kind of public area would want to um, screen the film and have discussions around it. And they were happy for this to happen because it was found money. But as the landscape became more competitive, there be, uh, the, the lowering of costs for distribution that were made possible by various technological innovations made filmmaking equipment much cheaper, made editing equipment much cheaper, and made making a film you know, seemed to be within everyone's reach, but distributing it became all the more challenging. And um, so, but I also wanted to have Randy here to represent educational uh, markets, because I think there is um, sometimes a bit of a disconnect when people think that their film has uh, uh, educational potential, and they find out that it's too long for the intended audience, if it's, uh, uh, you know, K through 12, there are all these kinds of issues. And certainly I wanted to have Bob here to help us sort through all the deals and all the conflicts and everything. So uh, to start off is, I think I want to start off with audience. Because that is, you know, um, when, certainly when I started in, in, uh, in this business, the other advantage to having the traditional distributor was as a filmmaker, you made a film, you handed it off to somebody else, and uh, Emily, it was your job and Nancy's job to figure out the audience, right? Yes, although we've always collaborated very closely with our filmmakers, truthfully. That was one of the things about Zeitgeist that set us maybe a little bit apart from other companies was there wasn't that sort of, okay, you take it and I'm gone. Um, the, the, 
the documentary, the fi particularly with documentaries, because the filmmaker has developed and cultivated already such a understanding of the subject and the audiences that w in making the film. So that's always been a component of it. Um, but it's our job to market it, certainly, and to distribute it and to monetize, clearly, you know, the release of the film in some way. And um, so that's, that's been... So, for instance, you know, for, uh, over the years, how, have, how has the landscape changed for you in terms of art house availability, in terms of... Well, it's, al it's, it's always been a very tough business. I, I think Nancy and I feel like survivors because we've really survived. 26 years is a long time, and we saw a lot of companies come and go. Uh, hundreds, to be honest, you know, or over 100 easily. Um, <coughs> crazy since 1988, which is when we began. Uh, so it's always been a difficult business. It's never been for the faint-hearted. It's gotten really difficult and really weird lately because of all of these new platforms and all of these new films and product, and it's changed. It's really, really, really changed. So. Now, you know, it's a bit of a new era, and it's a little bit of a feeling of Wild West, but I think things are always cyclical in this business as well, and it will find its level in some new way. These are, can be seen also as great opportunities for filmmakers because there are more platforms. There is, the bar is kind of down now. Before, if a distributor didn't take your film, you didn't really have anything that you could do with it. I mean, it wasn't, but now that's not true anymore. If a distributor doesn't take your film, you can still do the work to get your film out there and have the opportunity to do so. There are places where you can place it yourself. There's a lot of do-it-yourself stuff going on. Um, but don't you think that, I guess what, what I want to kind of zero in on is that, that part of that work that you did marketing um, was certainly um, a sense of, of who was actually going to engage with this film, right? And, and the filmmaker didn't, may have an engagement with the, the subject matter, but sometimes it was not in the filmmaker's wheelhouse to really yeah. understand. Yeah, well, that's true, and I, I, I'm, I'm, that was definitely, that is still part of, of, what, of what we do, is identifying those audiences. But it's, it's also a, it's a very much a relationship business, mm -hmm. too. We have just an extensive relationship with theaters and with people who play films, and we know what they like, and... You know, they know what we're delivering if we take a film on, that it's something that audiences and critics are going to be interested in, and we're going to have good materials for them, and a trailer, and posters, and things that are going to be enticing, and th that th there's stuff to work with there, and that they can rely on that. So, um, and then of course, they want to see that the film can do well, so you want to make the film be a the film set it up for success because if the film performs well in its initial release in let's say New York uh, for example but not always sometimes you can open in other cities first then 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 theaters will tend to really go the floodgates will kind of open and people will want to play it so it's positioning and it's setting up all of those things but i think that is a really a, a key point uh about uh where to open the film because i know there are there uh there is one uh, uh, distribution service that, that just in an almost cookie cutter fashion says you must open in New York and, and Los Angeles. And I know of a number of distributors who purposefully open films in other cities other than New York and Los Angeles to ensure that it will have a long life and, and because of their knowledge of the audience. Which I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you as a, as a distributor and Caitlin, you doing your work with you know, your relationships and Randy, the relationships you have with, with schools to see what is purchased and what isn't, you are kind of in constant touch with your audience, whereas un unfortunately a filmmaker, while he or she will have these options to do things on his, his or her own, won't come with that wealth of experience to know what hits, what city you know, to, to work with. Uh, uh, when I was working with a friend of mine, she said um, that uh, she was always happy when there was a film that would play to Jewish audiences because they love going to the theater. And she would not open it in New York, in Los Angeles. She would open it up in Miami. In Miami. <laughs> yes, you know. And, and by doing that, she would guarantee success for it. And then she would say, but this other category of film, this audience 
will not go into theaters, and so I only have um, a kind of cursory screening for the press opportunity and don't bother trying to put it on more than just, you know. And it's those kinds of things that are, are very difficult. I'm not saying you can't do it, but I just want to point out that that's, that is part of, of what you are getting when you are working with someone who's always in direct contact with the audience. And if you are doing it yourself, something to take into consideration in terms of how you build your team to make sure that the, the, your, team, your team members, your producers, the people who are working with you are really asking those questions over and over again and testing. And you know, the one thing, um, uh, it's, it's kind of the uh, borrowing from Philip Roth a little bit when he said that the point of life is not getting people right. In this case, the point of life is not getting the audience right on the first try. It's trying again and again and again until you really figure out where that audience is. And being open to that feedback because maybe your first inclination is not the one where you, you, you thought it would go. And, uh, you know, and so Caitlin, in terms of, as you said, in 2009, these community screenings were rather nascent, and now you really are formalizing them almost in the same way that the traditional relationships between uh, screens, so I'd love to have you talk about that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there are some, I mean, we try to bring some structure to what is a very um, fluid, otherwise a very fluid uh, relationship with audiences, because, um, the audiences who book screenings with us are really all over the map in terms of like how professionalized they are. Sometimes it is a programmer at a film series hosted at an art house theater, but much more often it's someone who's hosting the screening avocationally. They're an activist, they're an advocate, they're a volunteer, they're a member of a civic organization, they're a member of a, a synagogue. Um, they are an educator. Um, and so you see a lot of variation in sort of the um, frequency with which they have booked screenings before. Maybe they, many times they have never booked a screening before and we literally have to coach them through what they, you know, you will need a projector. Um, uh, <laughs> so yeah, step one. <laughs> step one, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating actually, that's... <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I sometimes liken it to, like, um, our role or the filmmaker's role in, in our circumstances, like um, the role of the farmer at the farmer's market. Like, if you're a farmer and you're at a farmer's market, you're selling directly to the consumer. And that consumer may have a great deal of knowledge about your product or none at all. Um, likely they have, more likely than not, they don't have much knowledge. And you have to tell them, this is how you cook this. This is how you know if it's ripe. This is why it costs so much. Um, this is where it came from. Um, and if the same farmer is selling to a grocery store, that conversation doesn't need to take place as, as much, or a different conversation takes place. A more, a more sort of professionalized, streamlined conversation takes place. And it's very much the same. Um, so so it, it is a major difference. I mean, it's like booking at an art, when we occasionally book, you know, we book one offs at art house theaters quite a bit, but usually not longer runs. And it's like a dream because, you know, <laughs> no, the pro, not, <laughs> I know, I know. It's not I, really a dream. Not to downplay the <laughs> complexity, but, but as opposed to the like, the person who's like, oh, we need a projector, uh, okay. Um, you know, it, you're having a whole different kind of conversation. And so I think that that's something to keep in mind if you're interested in pursuing um, an alternative distribution route that is not a traditional or conventional method. Um, you're just there's going to be a lot of variation in who you talk to and that and it, it won't be the same delivery of um, even though we try to deliver a standard package every time um, the end user may not have the same ability to uh, so it is a good idea on your website uh, to not take anything for granted when you mm, are yeah. reaching out to community screenings and have uh, a checklist for people like you said make sure they have a projector screen mm -hmm. uh, that they do a sound check you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, don't take anything for granted, uh, you know, in terms of your assumptions on the other side. And in terms of educational, um, there are, you know, what are some of the, you know, you receive films all the time for consideration. I know we've had this discussion ourselves uh, when I was um, uh, working with you at Film Buff. What are some of the assumptions that, that you know, you find um, filmmakers have that aren't necessarily correct about a successful engagement with the, uh, an educational audience? Um, it's a big question. <laughs> so, you know, we, um, 
We look at uh, films, we, we license films from many different places, from PBS and BBC and National Film Board of Canada, as well as from um, you know, smaller distributors uh, and indiv individual filmmakers. So um, when we work with indiv individual filmmakers, and I've made films myself and I've taught, so I feel like I have a lot of connection to the folks who are doing that. Um, you know, I, was, I did want to just give a couple of um, important things to think about. <laughs> One is, uh, think about the other films that have been made on the same topic. And while I know everybody says that, um, you know, that's the first question we ask ourselves. Oh, this is a film about, you know, bees. There's been a lot of films about bees. The crisis of bees is very serious, is going on, and a lot of people love bees, and they're making important films about it bees and we have one that we really love and we're not going to get anymore because we have one and it wouldn't make that much sense <laughs> to, um, to have many more. Um, so that's, you know, one thing that I think is really important. You know, we, we may want another one when something really important happens in the research. Um, but that's, yeah, just one, one thing that, you know, we see there's many films on you know, again, these very important issues, world, world water crisis, we, we get a lot, and you know, we have, we have quite a few, so, um, and our website is actually a great place to look if you <laughs> wanna look at the films that we have, films.com, just look around, we have, again, about 20,000 films there, so you can learn a lot about them. I think in terms of what films um, get um, purchased and what films do well also in streaming, um, something important to think about that, you know, I mean, this, this change from DVD to streaming, I've been in the job three years and it's really happened in that time, right? To go really where streaming is, that's, that's where it's all at. That's, that's what, what our customers the end user, want. The, that's what the end users are using. That's, that's you know, all the focus. Um, and, or most of the focus. Uh, and, you know, for us, it's really interesting to, to see the numbers and to see the usage and, you know, things like, uh, educational film about um, good tips for using the internet as a search engine. Using internet search engines, sorry. Kind of how to's. Uh, how to's, you know, um, we have a nursing collection. We have, all, you know, a lot of really educational videos, I would call them. They do very well. Um, now, do you think that's a reflection of um, also the, the, the changing um, the changing dynamics of educators, whether especially K through 12 have uh, have such highly regulated curricula now and uh, so many testing demands. Uh, uh -huh. Do you find that it's, that people are using films to watch them in their entirety or in modules or are they using, sh you know, creating their own short form? Um, I don't think I can speak as much to the K-12 market because mm -hmm. my, my colleague handles that oh. more than I do. Um, I think on the college level, what is nice actually with the streaming is that students can watch uh, the content out of the classroom. Of the classroom. So there is no longer that time limit of the class. Um, and we see a, you know, a lot of usage, we assume, comes from students who are assigned uh, content to look at or to research out of class. So you know, it becomes a very different kind of a product than you know, the, the screening where you get people in a room, very, very different. Um, and you know, I, I, one, one kind of anecdote I just want to put out there also is the difference between streaming and purchasing is also that, you know, a library may think it's very important to purchase a title about something that they think is very important to have. Um, that doesn't mean that a lot of people are going to watch it. So, you know, that title that might have sold a lot of copies might not get a lot of views in a streaming situation. And I think that you know, I think for everyone, we're all just trying to wrap our heads around these differences. Um, but, you know, and then there are certain subject areas that I think get a lot more usage than others. Psychology is, is huge because it's about people and so it's nice to watch video about people. You know, it's a little different than math, which doesn't <laughs> have as much benefit in using video. So I'm always happy to talk to anybody who has any films that they want to, you know, talk about educational distribution. and. No, no, I only mentioned the K question. through 12 because uh, one of the things I do, um, one of the other things I do is I'm the artistic director of the Global Peace Film Festival in Orlando. And we not only have just our regular festival films, uh, but we also look specifically for what I like to call mediums. 
Those are films uh, 25 minutes to 45 minutes because those are films that then I can take to our high school programs and uh, because if it's, well actually it has to be I think 40 minutes, that's the limit. Because bringing the kids out of, the, uh, out of class for those auditorium experiences, they're on a clock and that is just the longest film that, that I can show. So, you know, there are, uh, m my festival is a, uh, a breath of fresh air for a lot of filmmakers who have made these films that are not really shorts, but, you know, uh, take enough time to dig into a subject, but are, are, are neither feature length. And that home is, it, you know, for those school settings because of the time constraints that they have. So that's just one thing that, and I just want to add to that, which yeah. is that, you know, all of our films are broken up into shorter segments. Filmmakers may not like love that. that. <laughs> um, but what, can might we get work. a mic over? Thank you. Sorry, I just didn't hear how long those are, the educational mod or the segments that are broken up in the um, film. For well, films on demand, they're, they can be between two and four minutes. And, oh, that's and, short. And they're written about and, you know, uh, so... And for us, when we do these in-school uh, programs, uh, they can't be longer than 40 minutes. 40, mm -hmm. got it, thanks. Um, and, and Bob, since you, uh, you're not necessarily working with audiences, but you are certainly dealing with the way that the landscape has changed and the opportunities that are presented. I was just reading in one of the trades that the upcoming MIP out of, um, out of the thousands of buyers, about a quarter of them are going to be just strictly VOD and SVOD buyers. And uh, so that does, though, speak to the audiences changing from this traditional way of interacting with films to uh, the subscription models and, and VOD. But it also means a difference in terms of monetization and in terms of, of just the deal structure, correct? Uh, tr true, and it, you have to really give some thought to um, Again, the, na the nature of, of, say, the documentary, I mean, you have to realize, it's almost like working backwards. I had a client once who made a deal with one of the uh, streaming services, and, you know, got a nice piece of change, but the problem is, as soon as that happened, uh, basically, we tried to have a deal with uh, a cable uh, channel, and they were not interested at all. We even offered to you know, reduce the licensing fee. And he said, no, 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 no. It's almost like being, you know, it, we, they consider those streaming services as another, you know, another outlet for content. Mm -hmm. And they, they just were not interested in that. And that was kind of a, you know, uh, kind of a difficult lesson. And I said, when did you do this? <laughs> um, but, but regardless, I think it, that's the idea where everyone says, they, you know, they, they want to, get eyeballs and let's go to the streaming service but the question is usually you're going to get a certain fee or a flat amount and whether it's watched one time or a million times you're basically you know you, that's what you got i mean will there be times where there'll be maybe a bonuses and things like that well it depends on the film you know and, and it's really more for like the, the mainstream entertainment films so you have to kind of I always consider the streaming services the kind of the last stop on the train you know and I think you have to just take a look at uh, you know and then you have to deal with the issue of you know when it comes to well streaming or 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 physical DVDs as I said you kind of have to remember that the educational market started with 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter films where basically to rent, not to own, but to rent the print, you had to pay about you know, 200, 300, 150, whatever you know, it, it went for. And basically uh, what happened was the technology changed and again, now you had VHS and DVD and ba basically you were saying, again, you went to the institutions and they say, well, how much is it? Well, they now could purchase it. They're not going to really rent it. Um, at, you know, so it's like, well, it's $200, $250. And, and then, of course, it raises the issue of, well, okay, that's the educational market, the institutional market, but what about the consumer, the retail market, and the question of how to coordinate that so that basically 
you know, you don't have t teachers who probably will be nameless, who basically, instead of the school putting up $150, $200, so they basically go in and they purchase online the consumer rate of $24.95, $29.95, $19.95, $30.95, and it kind of guts, and it guts, and it kind of guts the market. And it's an interesting question that you know, at what point do the, and of course the educators should, and you can talk to this much better about uh, how long sh or, or should there be a window for educational before it goes to the consumer, or you know, and how long should it be, and how long can they can wait, and basically. They want to have a presence out, and whatever you know, in terms of television or streaming, and that, and then basically you have to kind of work around, you know, work within those parameters. But when you, when you, and um, we'll get a um, mic right here. Oh, you got a mic. Go ahead. I just have a question. Uh, uh, actually, two questions. Do you, when you acquire distribution rights, do you ask for exclusive distribution? You do. Okay. Uh, no, I was nodding it. I was expecting the question. <laughs> um, we we ask for exclusive, especially uh, in for certain films. Um, not always. So it's okay. a, it's really a case by case basis. Okay. And my so. second question is, when you acquire a film that's say 14 minutes, do you break it up into segments or does the does the producer do it or who does that? We actually uh, work with a company that that does that work, um, and they're, you know, really smart people who okay. actually sit down and write <laughs> these segments that, um, it's, they're not broken up in that they won't play together, they'll, they'll all play, but I, I actually find it really helpful because it just gives you a little bit more detail about a film. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, you bring up a very good point about, um, again, to kind of bring this back to thinking about your audience, is that if you're, if you're thinking about weighing an educational window versus a consumer window, trying to think about do I have, uh, should I hold out for television? Um, that is part of, of stepping back and, and as realistically as possible, uh, doing as much research about the, the people you think are really going to connect with and purchase and how they purchase it and how they find out about film to then help you sort through the, you, these potential conflicts. Because if your film, um, is about bees, <laughs> and and you know that uh, you know that some of the distributors that you find uh, are already full up on bee films. Then you might want to say, well, I'm not going to um, wait 18 months for an educational window. I'm going to steam ahead and do something else. If you've looked around, you found out that your television prospects are not. Uh, you give them a, a you know a, a, a time to test them out. If you find out they are not going to pan out, don't wait for the perfect deal. So it is a little bit of a juggle, right? Of of making sure that the good is not the enemy of the perfect. Can right? I can I ask yes. something about that? I mean, I think for years people have talked about windows, and those windows have all changed. Yes. So you know, I think people used to say it's this, and, you know, it's this and that and that and that and that. And so I wonder how how people are talking about that. Well, Emily, do you want to talk well, to, because you certainly dealt with the... I, I, no, yeah. windows have definitely, I would say, collapsed, <laughs> probably is the best word. Um, but that said, it's complicated, because if you have a theatrical film that's going day and date VOD, which is the sort of really ultimate, I think, collapsible window, um, that theatrical release is, in most cases, going to be pretty small. It's going to be pretty perfunctory. It's going to be maybe in a few markets because most theaters are not going to really play a film that's been already available on VOD um, unless, you know, you open it in like a thousand theaters right away and, and then, and also to, which I guess some companies could do, but that's certainly not a model that we... And ooh, it's still being felt out even by the majors. And even by those. So um, we are still trying to respect I won't say the traditional windows, but you know we've collapsed our windows a little bit, but we've never done a day and date release on um, theatrical and, and VOD uh, because it, it just hasn't made sense for us and for the type of films that we have. So, you know, but, but that's, that's an area that's really definitely up. up windows are know, definitely windows in flux. Are, <laughs> yeah, and I, I also think just to 
add to that briefly that um, because some opportunities, not only are windows collapsed, but um, the sort of way you could work around mutual exclusivity before through the mechanism of windows has therefore also collapsed. And so we work with a lot of clients who have to make tough decisions about do we want this or this um, because it is no longer the case that there might be an 18 month sort of rollout across you know various revenue streams um, in a sort of uh, simultaneous or in a you know um, success sequential way yeah um, it's it's making decisions about um, does this contract will this offer go away if we do this other thing you know if we will this VOD offer go away if we give a window to our educational distributor will the educational distributor go away if they don't get that window and that requires a level of sort of um, I think legal savvy that maybe was not required as much before of filmmakers because there are so many contracts and you can speak to this I'm yeah. sure well I think it's it, it, it's both it legal and I think certainly it's business oriented it's like it's more than just producing and directing a documentary now you have to go out and market it and you have to be your own distributor or self distributor uh, I mean it's a the, the job has gotten a lot bigger and just to make life interesting the revenues have gotten somewhat smaller <laughs> <laughs> along, along the way because what used to be DVDs you know dollars have now turned into digital pennies for you know for for the moment hopefully that will that will basic basically change I, again you know I think you can, can use some examples like if you're going to first go educationally you know you don't go to VOD <laughs> I mean <laughs> unless there's a real <laughs> strong reason for doing that so there I mean there is a certain logic or reasoning to the windows although they are collapsing as well it's, I think especially more for the fiction features where it's like it's less than three months you go yeah, it's VOD <laughs> and sometimes it's the same time which most theaters unless it's landmark <laughs> or <laughs> one of those basically makes it a lot more difficult so yeah I think you know it's, it's an interesting question where you know is it, sometimes it's the attorney sometimes it's a distribution consultant you know I mean your your team kind of you know kind of gets enhanced in the process of getting it out. And you need to have that good team. We've got a question right over here. Um, this is a question for Randy. Um, you mentioned that you have such a broad um, market and you know really what, what works and what doesn't. Do you ever commission specific to the, the needs that you have? And a larger question for the panel is how does the role of companies like Netflix producing their own content and not just streaming, how does that affect filmmakers and what's the sort of future you know, how does that affect your distribution deals and things like that? Um, Films Media Group does do co-productions or commissions or different kinds of arrangements. Um, a lot of time it's for more edu educational, instructional uh, videos, or nursing or tech ed or, or something like that. Um, but if there are, you know, specific subjects we're looking for, we, we do work with, uh, I have a, one colleague who, who primarily does that. Um, I don't think I can speak to the Netflix question. Well, I'll, I would say that sounds to me like a great opportunity for filmmakers, right? There's another somebody who's willing to pay up to produce a film, and it won't be a theatrical film uh, unless they decide that they want to open it in theaters, which I guess they could decide if they want to do. They did that with Virunga, I guess, That's right? right yeah. But uh, for the most part, it's working in that digital space. Um, but hey, like. W wasn't it what the Emmys this year or something? It was like Amazon and all these like p players had these award-winning films that chose. It's it's cha you know it's just very different. The studios, the networks didn't have anything, and it was all these digital people that that had the award-winning sh shows that everybody wanted to watch. So I see that as a great f thing for filmmakers. I would think. Yeah, don't you, don't no. you remember when uh, the cable guys <laughs> were locked out of the Emmys for so the, long the and Ace had the, awards. the Ace Awards? <laughs> That's a right. right. judge of the Ace Awards. And then yeah. almost all, right out of the gate, yeah. Amazon gets recognized yeah. that, you know, yeah, for an Emmy. You know, HBO really, must have been stewing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they, it, they, they can't, you know, but that, that's true, but they also have, you know, they, they've been at the forefront of of, of producing great docs. Well, I think, well, yeah, basically, Kelly, when you mentioned 40 minutes, it's kind of not a magic number, but it happens to be the maximum that a, a short can be for a Academy Award consideration. 
and that and not that New York and Los Angeles are like the be all and end all of markets, but the academy has basically said you have to run it for a week in New York and LA and so forth. The rules are you know, they are on the website and the problem and in Canada have gone to television, it couldn't go to VOD, I mean, you know, or you cancelled yourself out. So it's another thing that's interesting, I think that distributors and as well as filmmakers keep in mind. In fact, I know one who purposely did a short and she had done two features because she wanted a chance to be nominated for an Academy Award for the short and she did and she won. <laughs> So yeah, so that's about assessing your market and figuring out where the competition isn't. <laughs> I was just gonna make an observation about VOD. It seems like companies uh, like Magnolia who have that affiliation with the landmark theater chain, they're the ones that do a lot of that day and date release. But speaking as someone who's self-distributing my film theatrically, I've been screening in art house cinemas, um, as you say, they're not gonna screen your film if it's already available on VOD. And so I've, you know, cognizant of that. Um, so you can't screen in the landmark cinemas. Only if you have Magnolia as your distributor. Oh, that's a very so good point. I that's think it's really yeah. interesting. There's, 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 um, the rules are, are, are made to be broken, obviously, but they only apply in certain situations. Right. I, well, I think what you really also are drawing out is the fact that there used to be these clean distinctions. There was an exhibitor who did nothing but exhibit. There was a cable company that did nothing but replay things that had first probably been on, on television or in the theaters. There was a retail site that just uh, sent you things as a retail. Now uh, everybody's switching hats, sitting in different seats. Is Amazon a retailer or is it a television channel? Or is it, you know, is, is it a producer? Is it, is it a floor cleaning product or a dessert topping? We don't know. So we, and they don't know yet either. So, uh, so you're right, but that is a very good thing to point out because unfortunately in this kind of landscape now, um, we, I think all of us are operating on those old general rules that if your, you know, if your moniker, if your label was that you're an exhibitor, that then you're, you're you know, uh, then, then as an exhibitor, you as the individual filmmaker should be able to approach that exhibitor. Now you find out that there are all of these other relationships that uh, exclude people because they are no longer a pure exhibitor because of all, and that's part of research again, is determining, you know, what your landscape looks like, is, is pulling back from the curtain and saying, if I want to play in markets that are dominated by, by landmark, then I have to think about what my options are in that market. It's also interesting to me, I'd love to know um, from, uh, I guess, uh, Emily or anyone on the panel, what they, uh, how they make a determination uh, as to the potential of a film when you acquire rights. Uh, I know that's, that's a kind of a, a tough question. <coughs> yeah, that is a very tough question actually, but I'll try to take it on since you know, I seem to have had a pretty good streak of it. I, I feel very proud of all the films that we've done and I think we've had, you know, really a great vision in building our catalog and in picking filmmakers and identifying talent and working with, you know, directors who've gone on to amazing things, in, including Laura Poitras, because we did her first two films, My Country, My Country and The Oath. So, but the way to answer that is really, I'd, I'd say it's just, it's just a way that we have of this, I mean, we just look at the films. We, we, when I say we, I mean my partner Nancy and, and myself for the most part, although you know, sometimes there's others involved, but we make the ultimate decisions about what we take on. It's what we love or what we see that we feel we could identify an audience for it has to have just a certain quality of standard. We have to feel like it's going to be something that will get good reviews, that critics will like it. They don't always in every market, and we've certainly had our share of bad reviews, including the Zero Motivation review that, that I, Manolo hated that film and gave us a terrible review in the New York Times, and it really you know killed it for us. And it was a great film, and everyone loved it, but her. But anyway. Um, 
you know, it's, it, but it's, but we loved it. We loved the film and we felt there'd be an audience for this film. This is a film for women. This is a film for, uh, you know, this was, it was an Israeli film. It was, so it had a Jewish audience that's always very reliable as we discussed earlier. You know, but all of our, most are, all of our successful documentaries have really had that kind of specific great audience that would really love the film, but the film was really great. And I'm thinking, mo first and foremost, just right now in my head, of, of Bill Cunningham, New York, for example. That was a film that just connected with audiences everywhere. I think nobody else bought that film because they thought, oh, that's just going to play in New York. And not even as significantly as it ended up doing. It broke house records at Film Forum, which is a theater we've been playing our films at for you know, decades. And that film broke house records for all of the films that they ever opened at the time. I don't know if it's been broken since, but anyway, at the time. Uh, but it was, but it, that film had so much humanity and Bill is just such an amazing person and he didn't have anything to do with the film or promoting it. He didn't want to even see it. So it wasn't like we had that publicity thing going. It was just, but it was about fashion. It was about New York. It had connected with audiences and it was great. And it just took off, and it won a lot of audience awards at festivals, and we knew that. So even though it hadn't gotten like jury prizes, it had gotten a lot of audience awards. So, you know, we just we just felt like the, we just took. But it's always a gamble. It's you never know. You just never know. It's just a gamble. That's why I'm still in the business because I love that gamble. I love to just throw my cards down and, you know, or put my money on that horse and feel like this is the horse, this is going to make it. And you do your utmost to, to really get it there, but you have to love the horse and you have to, you know, feel that the horse can really perform. Well, and if I could just, just before I take the next question, just to kind of pull out the <coughs> model that, that you, you know, you've done this for so long and, and it's so much a part of you, but for people who are thinking about their own film, what you really illustrated was you identified a film that you knew would connect with people who go to theaters, and the method by which you reach them, they're the tastemakers that influence them, would be reviews and press, and, uh, you know, and, and those are the elements of, of identifying who your audience is, who will pay for it, and how to reach them in order to get them. When Caitlin is working with a film, uh, you know, that is uh, backed by foundations interested in the subject matter, instead you are looking at m maybe f people who are not interested in documentary as a form and don't necessarily go to see them in theaters, but will go to see them in community areas, and then you will find the methodology by which they hear about things and who the tastemakers and influencers are and use what is often called affinity group networking. So I just wanted to pull that kind of model out because you do this so seamlessly, but there is actually a model there in terms of how you were saying, I, I know this will connect with this type of audience that does go to movies. If you have a film that um, uh, connects with someone who doesn't go to films, um, like I remember helping a, uh, a young filmmaker when I was still at IFC who had a film about skateboarders. And they had tremendous, uh, it was actually a, a wonderful documentary, really provocative. They had the backing of vans, you know, the, the shoes that all the skateboard kids wear. And, and they were really excited about the theatrical. And what they learned was that uh, even though all of the skateboard kids thought it was really authentic and really finally showed their culture in a way that nobody else did, they don't go to movies. And they also don't read the New York Times. So what, you know, what was unfortunate was there wasn't an opportunity to stand back and, and kind of learn from that mistake and have a plan B, you know, and, and then reposition the film in a different way because there actually weren't as many uh, online outlets and VOD and so forth. So that's what I mean by kind of testing your audience. It's important as often as you can to, to test your own assumptions about who your audience is, mm -hmm. about how they consume the work, and, and the, you know, the people who catch their ear and eye in terms of influencing and taste making. Because it's going to be different for different categories and for different types of formats. Mm -hmm. As I'm sure we've all, it's the same with educators. Uh, one of the, the key things that I remember um, from working uh, with filmmakers on writing text for educational uh, consumers is to avoid adjectives. Flourish. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to guess. So if you could speak to that, that, that you know, Randy, if you could speak to yeah, how to write I mean, for. We're, 
Yeah. We're well, the always study the study guides, especially because that's the added value you get mm -hmm. with an educational sale that you don't have for a consumer. Yeah, definitely. And and in general, just any text. I mean, when I'm reading anything, you know, I just want to know what is this about. You know, that that that. Um, when the audience watches it, they can get into the feeling of it and the, and the this is powerful and all of that. But for the educational context, I think it's very important that this is something that can fit into a curriculum, you know, to really think about how are people teaching subjects and how um, do they think about just, you know, where does this connect with what, what's in their textbook or what's standard curriculum. Um, also on the university level. And also no sex or drugs. <laughs> or <Yes>. swears. <laughs> I think we have one question in the back first. Thank uh, you. Hi. I have two questions. Uh, one is about representation. I made a film 10 years ago in the gay and lesbian circuit. It, it won all these audience awards and I got distributed by Wolf Video um, for about five years. And I got it on Netflix and it sold on Amazon and all that stuff. And then once they dropped it because it you know, was older, um, everything went away. And recently I was like, well, let me see if Netflix will do it again for streaming. And I, I sent them an email and I got like this generated email back saying, if you don't have representation, basically we won't even read your email. So I guess, you know, when they have an older film that still would probably be good, maybe for like educational, for like gay and lesbian or women's studies, um, what, what do you do if you don't have representation? The second one is the film I'm doing now is, um, it's, it's kind of, it's weird. It's about Vietnam vets from, Alaska. We like it already. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, I think it's going to be the kind of thing that maybe Film Sprout would help with, like getting veterans or Native Americans involved with like small, you know. Um, I guess my question is, when you said before about like, you need a strategy, um, how much does it cost to like talk to Sprout? Or how, how would it cost to talk to a lawyer about like, because each individual film is unique and you know what I mean? So I would like to talk to someone first about like that. Well, I think in terms of, of dollar amounts, we'll we'll let you guys retire to uh, you know uh, to talk about that after uh, you know right after the panel. You'll certainly have time to talk to these folks. Yeah, I didn't. But mean just that, in the general, yeah, I didn't mean it for me. Thing. I just meant like when you're. You're making yeah. a movie and, and you're kind of broke. What what is this gonna? What do I have to raise well, on Kickstarter I, so, before I can? So let me let me take it from this direction. Let me let me actually take it from this direction. That I think what people don't take into account. Um, I know you're, you're speaking of an older title, but especially assuming that people are working on new titles and you yourself are also working on a new title, is that I think when people approach their film budget, they approach their film budget just to get the film made, and that's not enough. You need to approach that film budget to include uh, working out that strategy, who, what consultants you will need to bring in along the way. You will need to include representation. Say you, you get the golden ticket and you, uh, your film is accepted into Sundance. If you don't have money for a proper publicist, you are not going to make the most of that opportunity. And so if, if uh, yeah, you know, Bob? I, yeah, I had a client who didn't have a publicist and he kind of cried uh, when he got there. Um, it, but can I just say something really quick? You know, as a documentary filmmaker, I've been making this home for five years. I raised $75,000. It is in increments. I, every grant I've oh, gotten, yeah. it was a third time of getting it. So of course it's in my list, but that is not the number one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to get stuff that finishes the film. Well, well ironically, one of the original reasons, rationales for digital rights was, and this started with actually with John Sloss, and uh, when it was called cinema, uh, you know, Cinetic Rights Management, the film buff was taking films like Metropolitan and Slacker that were on the shelf and basically finding new revenue streams for them. That was one of the initial purposes, and it was ancillary added on income. It was never really intended to be the initial uh, form of distribution or revenue. That's something that's kind of got twisted and contorted into shape that people have to deal with now. And there is also a site, Fandor, which uh, you might want to check out in terms of Fandor. Um, Ted Hope recently had been there for a year, left, but they are doing very interesting things uh, with films from older films, art house films, across all kinds of categories. Uh, so check them out for your older friends. And I don't think you need a, a representation to, to work with them. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't necessarily. Um, hi. I have a question for Caitlin. Could you talk us through what happens when someone comes to you? Like, can you give us a case study of something that you think is like 
optimal, maybe for a, sh a short, um, a film that I'm working on is, is 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I have one other question that's a short question, which is, do you recommend putting money into designing your own DVD? Like, is that a good use of money to like package something and make it beautiful? Or is streaming now taking over that? So, an easy question and then a longer question. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, so I'll give you an example of, uh, I would say, um, a great scenario. Um, we currently represent a film called Vessel, um, which is about reproductive rights. It's about a, a woman who, um, a, doc a Dutch doctor who sails a ship to ports of countries where abortion is completely illegal and she performs the abortions um, with pharmaceuticals, with pills, the abortion pill offshore in international waters so that it's legal. And it's more of a publicity stunt than like a solution to the problem, obviously. So the film traces her journey as a, an activist and kind of a maverick in her space. And um, very kind of classic trajectory with that particular film and client. We first met the filmmaker, or introduced to the filmmaker when she was um, in post-production and had an initial informal conversation, um, which we do for all new clients, and it's free. Um, and um, kind of got the quick lay of the land. Like, what are you looking for? What's your timeline looking like? What are your festival aspirations? And then we followed up a few months later, and she said, you know, she was applying to festivals, and she said, you know, I really want to start raising money for an outreach campaign, um, and, and also want to know what I should be doing on the festival circuit to kind of seed that effort. Um, and so she hired us um, just as consultants. So we didn't commit to taking on the project, but we came on as consultants, and we spent about 10 hours with her over probably about six months, so a little bit here and there. And we helped her create an outreach plan and a budget um, and sort of a rationale for you know, how to approach funders with, um, with a proposal to bring the film on the road, bring it you know, in a community screenings campaign. Um, but of course, there's so many unknowns. So she, you know, she ended up premiering at South by Southwest. So that's a great, you know, that's the first great thing. And then she you know, had an amazing festival circuit, really, really did very well on the festival circuit. And, um, pursued broadcast, pursued VOD, pursued theatrical. And um, as those things kind of came into view and the offers came into view, we, among several others um, who were guiding and, and um, supporting her, um, offered you know, our sense of what the best approach would be as different opportunities came into view and then fell out of view. And, and like I said, different things were mutually exclusive. Um, you know, and um, what ended up happening is she ended up having an exclusive run at um, the IFC Center, um, so just a New York engagement theatrically for, for a week, and um, making a deal with Film Buff um, for the um, VOD. And she didn't get a broadcast deal um, and went out quite professionally with the help of one of her funding agents um, to, to pitch that. So it's like, you know, she tried. Um, and we decided, in light of all of that, um, to run the community screenings campaign. Basically, you know, uh, started about six months after her festival premiere, and have it um, start well in advance of her VOD release. Um, we negotiated with the VOD distributor to push their um, date back, um, and they were actually remarkably amenable to that. And to their credit, um, but also to their benefit, because our community screenings campaign, which began on September 1 of last year and, and ends July 15th, um, the VOD was released in mid-January um, on uh, transactional platforms. Um, it, our efforts seeded that, the publicity for that VOD. Um, for that VOD release and the publicity that hit and the press that hit and the reviews that hit around the, that VOD drop um, also you know, breathed new life into our efforts. So it was, like, it was really a, a r ideal scenario. And that's for a film that is in the common place that films are where there's a lot going for it, but not everything comes through. You know, she couldn't check the broadcast box and that, and that didn't come through. Isn't that, that going on public TV? Is Vessel going? No, no, no. Okay. no. Do you no. think the broadcast was because it was about abortion and broadcasters? Yeah, I mean, it's about abortion. It's a tough, it's a tough sell. Like it was also, I believe it was also a foreign language film, wasn't it? Yeah, in part. Yeah, yeah I think that's also very difficult. Yeah, we didn't There's even get a chance to cover how difficult those are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there are many strikes against it. So that's you know that's a typical relationship, and we didn't decide to come on board just to you know to summarize. We didn't decide to come on board 
um, to run the whole campaign until we knew from that festival run and um, well, so we knew from the festival run what audiences were responding to and where they were responding and who the audiences were. We had a sense. Um, and we also then, you know, six months into the festival run, we knew what the distribution trajectory was likely to be. And so we could slot ourselves into that in a way that was strategic for the film and good for the filmmaker and good for her career and, you know, um, f both financially and, and also in terms of social impact for the film. Um, and, and it's a complicated... Um, process to figure all of that out and and like you said it's a gamble even though you might bring best practices to the table so that's so that's very common and then the community screenings campaign was intended to be six months and it went so well um, that um, we, we've extended it we have a question right here uh, I wonder if each of the three distributors could talk about their financial model in broad terms how it works with a filmmaker Randy do you sure. want to <laughs> There I am. Um, so we pay um, uh, producers a royalty uh, on each, you know, sale or each view of the film. You're not quoting, you're not quoting percentages. I'm not quoting percentages. <laughs> now we can speak um, well, I, privately. No, I'm, I'm just in a broad sense. I. <laughs> what do what do educate? All right, you're you're not going to do it. It's all different. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's all different. Yes. Well, here's an yes. interesting question. When you basically deal with educational rights, uh, is it on a single title by title basis, or is there bundling? And if there's bundling, you know, like a slate of films, how is that right. calculated? So okay. So um, for our streaming collections, which is like a bundle, where uh, a institution licenses uh, the whole collection. The whole nursing collection. The whole right. nursing collection, for example. Uh, we have a royalty pool, uh, so part of that goes to producers. And then it is a purview amount, um, you know, depending on the collection and the mathematical formula, but it's, it's based on how many views. So different than, you know, you were talking about some of the, you know, VOD platforms where they just pay, pay out a certain amount and then it doesn't matter how many times it's seen. For us, it's, it's about, the views, yeah. Is, is it like every time somebody starts the film? Could you have your friends go out and it's, start it 25 times? Um, if you knew that your friends had it, yes, you could. Um, it's, it's a 30 second view is what counts as a view. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, just in a broad sense. In a broad sense. Um, so in a broad sense, there's a number of different models that Zeitgeist um, uses. Sometimes we, um, we pay uh, some kind of an advance or minimum guarantee to the filmmaker to acquire the rights. And then we put up the, what's known as the P&A, which is the print and advertising funding, so the distribution costs. And then from the revenues of the film, uh, we recoup those costs and then we split what's left with the producer, usually a 50-50 split. So it's a kind of a pretty fair deal. Um, and then of course we recoup any advance that was paid prior from the 50% split that of net receipts that the filmmaker would get. That's a fairly standard general type of a deal. But that said, we have off also often acquired films for no minimum guarantee, but just a just funding p and I mean, it depends on the film. Uh, and we have also done something uh, called service deals, where we get hired by the filmmaker to give a film a theatrical release. They may retain some of the other rights that have value, like the ancillary rights, but they want the film to have a theatrical release because uh, that will enhance the value of those rights and the willing to pay for that. So we've done those deals too. Um, and uh, honestly, there isn't, you know, we, we, we really are very, we're a very small company and we work very individually with every filmmaker, so it will just depend. I used to represent, uh, I used to represent uh, some service companies because it isn't really just an ego thing, you know, in terms of having a, th a theatrical release. It's really, I guess if you get cynical about it, you know, your theatrical release is kind of a big trailer for your ancillary rights. And, it, and it's a way that basically you can, you know, cultivate and market because one thing I've noticed that VHS and DVD and, and VOD 
they don't really market. People don't realize that the marketing of for VHS DVD was not to the consumer. It was to the retailer. It was to the Walmarts and the uh, blockbusters. May rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> and, and basically, uh, so I think this is where you're, you know, sometimes you're going to have to do self-distribution or you engage a service company, which might be for a fee or a percentage. These are all the other parts of the scenario that you handle first and probably before you get into digital and television because you know you want to get it out and make make it and it, basically you have to make it an event frequently for documentaries where sometimes there's a q and a and all that uh, which you, you don't see obviously for fiction oh yeah we're we're a simple fee for service model, so we are paid a flat fee to run the campaign and we return 100% of the revenues to the filmmaker um, and um, we coordinate both licensing, you know, the, the fee, the monies that come in are both licensing fees for the rental of the film for that particular exhibition and we also coordinate the speakers' appearances and speakers and the, and the fees that, you know, um, attend those filmmaker appearances at some percentage of those exhibitions so that comes into the revenue stream too. I just was going to say, uh, first of all, that's probably why the music business is, <laughs> is no longer existent because they made deals with the, all the artists are making deals with Walmart and Amazon and there's no more record business for se. But anyway, um, I noticed that you said you did, did a lot of international films with your documentaries and I went, do you uh, uh, dub or subtitles or what do you do? About Only subtitled. We don't dub. There's no dubbing for the type of films we're doing in the markets where we're, we're doing them. They're, they're, they're subtitled. All right. And they're subtitled when we acquire them. Right. It's interesting because I just saw a film uh, called uh, Defret, which is an oh, Ethiopian yeah. film. I know that film. I saw that. Yeah, which basically it's not a documentary, but it's made like a documentary. And I worked on it. Oh, really? <laughs> with Defret, yeah, when it was called something else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was actually in world competition for... Um, for uh, you know, basically for Sundance. And it's interesting because yeah. about Ethiopia, I mean, that's a place yeah. where educational and niche marketing really can come into play. And uh, international foreign language has their own challenges, which could be a whole panel on, <laughs> on its own. And we have, I think, one time for one more question. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Um, how many times have you paid a filmmaker something after the, the um, uh, when you give a, a, a flat fee? Okay, we, we've, we've well, only I done a, if you've been not a flat fee. A flat okay. fee is like, we, we actually did that once with a foreign language film, but that was from a country that just didn't want to deal with any further royalties, so we paid up front. I should get I'm advanced, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it was, it was a buyout. Yeah. A, a buyout, but that, that was very unusual, but most of the time it's a royalty, it's a royalty deal. So what is your question is? My question is like, once you do an advance, how many times have you ever paid something after the advance? Oh, I've had several, uh, oh well, I mean, it? often. I mean, most okay. of the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. gosh. That's why people love us so much. We have a great <laughs> reputation. That's why we're no, still in business all these years. <laughs> yeah. If we didn't pay beyond that, I don't, you know, that would be a quick way to sink. Um, I mean, first of all, we don't overpay for films to begin with. We offer fairly modest advances in most cases because we're not going to take a huge risk on something. We can't afford to. So... If the film was a success, then the advances almost immediately can be recouped very, very quickly. Um, and we also don't overspend. We, we keep our spending to um, a really realistic uh, minimum to achieve the most that we can from a film. And therefore, when a film does do well, like something like Bill Cunningham, New York, which I'll use again as an example, we returned a lot of money because we didn't, I think another distribution company would have spent way more than we did. That film played all over and they would have done bigger ads and really put, and, and they wouldn't have returned as much to the filmmaker. Right, we but but we have a different model than that and so we, we just, we spend appropriately because we want to also make uh, the money too because it's a 50-50 net deal. So what the, what the filmmaker is getting is what we're making as well, so. And the, the one last thing I'll say, just pulling a, a word out from that last answer, was the word risk. So, um, you know, kind of in my role as a mother hen, you know, really think carefully about what you're risking in terms of what kinds of budgets and to whom you owe. 
in relationship to this very chaotic market where uh, you know, uh, we no longer have the, the kind of surety that we used to have with uh, cable deals. When I worked at IFC, I was buying shorts. Um, you know, no, I don't really know of anybody who's buying shorts anymore. And Sundance and IFC, uh, the shorts that they run are commercials now. Um, you know. <laughs> But they do tell a full story in 30 seconds. Well, just, just <laughs> let me say that it, uh, one, one uh, director was shocked that basically his deal was purely a digital distribution, no theatrical, no DVD. And so it, right. it, in fact, one, with one client, we said, we'll go back to you, but if you don't put in a DVD component, we're not, you know, we're not as interested. We can go to an aggre ever aggregator. And they had the wherewithal to basically guarantee it even if they have to do it themselves. Yeah, so do, do think about that risk that you're willing to take on in this chaotic market and set your expectations as, as realistically as possible, but of course still keep reaching for that dream uh, and you know the drive that keeps all of you uh, going and making films. And I want to thank you so much for coming out and thank my panel. <laughs> <laughs>